welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Sharon Van Sickle Robbins, president of City Club, and I would like to welcome you all, those of you here with us today at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio, or watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Thank you for joining City Club today on February 18th for this week's Friday Forum. In consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, would everyone in the room please make sure your cell phones are silenced. Today we will hear from Mayor Sam Adams about the state of the city. But first, a few announcements. I'd like to thank our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, and I'd also like to offer our appreciation to the Friday Forum corporate sponsors whose generous financial support make these Friday Forums possible. We are extremely pleased to have as our winter quarter sponsors Stoll Reeves, The Standard, and West Coast Bank. Please join me in extending our sincere appreciation. If your company or firm would like to be a City Club sponsor, please contact City Club staff at the back of the room or call the City Club office. This spring, City Club will offer a coordinated series of thought-provoking programs that will challenge conventional political wisdom and explore genuinely innovative and long-term solutions to Oregon's fiscal crisis. Kicking off with a talk by Governor John Kitzhaber on March 4th, City Club's Friday forums and other events will investigate new ways to stimulate economic development, improve government services, and ensure adequate revenue. Keep your eyes open for more about our spring series, From Crisis to Opportunity, Exploring Solutions to Oregon's Fiscal Challenges. And now to today's program. Despite its accomplishments in areas such as alternative transportation, sustainability, and attracting a creative class, Portland still struggles with some fundamental challenges, such as joblessness and underemployment, chronic educational underachievement, and inequality of opportunity. Portland must address these long-standing issues in order to succeed in the t intense global competition of the 21st century. Today, Mayor Sam Adams will examine the challenges and opportunities facing Portland and will explain how we can position Portland as an agile city focused on innovation, equity, and success. Sam first gravitated to politics as a student at the University of Oregon when he interned in Congressman Peter DeFazio's office. He then worked for the Oregon House Democratic Campaign Committee and for Democratic Majority Leader Carl Hostica before successfully managing Vera Katz's first campaign for mayor in 1991. At age 29, he began the first of 11 years as the youngest mayoral chief of staff in the city's history. Adams won a seat on the Portland City Council in 2004, where he was a commissioner in charge of Portland's Office of Transportation and the Bureau of Environmental Services. He was elected mayor in May 2008. And now, please help me welcome today's speaker, Mayor Sam Adams. Thank you. Thank you very much. What a, uh, what a great crowd. Well, the prevailing theme in government today across the country is recovery, and understandably so. The recession has been brutal for Americans and for far too many Portlanders. These years have strained our families and our neighborhoods in ways that haven't been felt since the Great Depression. And so mayors and governors and elected leaders are framing the years ahead as the need to recover. Well, for the past two years, the focus of my administration, the work of your city council and your city staff has been to attend to the new flood of victims of this national recession and has done more than that. 
We also decided two years ago, in addition to uh, aiming for recovery, that we were going to seek a more lasting resilience. And we began the effort to tackle issues like our boom and bust economy, our decades-long educational gap, and the root causes of crime and the basic inequalities that have plagued this city for far too long. We're aiming for a more long-lasting and permanent resilience, and we are staring the most deep-seated problems that we face as a community in the face, including too many middle-income wage earners saddled with anemic job opportunities, low wages, and deep debt, an abysmal high school graduation rate with just 64% of our eighth graders going on to graduate from high school, too many Oregonians suffering from hunger, poverty, underemployment, and higher, at higher rates than our big city neighbors and a persistent and persistent social inequities that cripple our collective performance, damage our dignity, and violate our deep-rooted sense of fair treatment. The work we've been doing to address these fundamental flaws is not necessarily media sexy. It can be messy and has been at times controversial. It cuts across jurisdictions. But it's about investing not only in helping people through the recession, but in the kind of systemic change that doesn't necessarily take years to come to fruition. It might take months, but it certainly does not take days. Because we started this work, though, more than two years ago, we're now in better shape than many cities who uh, necessarily didn't uh, start the work as soon as we did. For example, the city has a budget surplus this year. While other cities are sharply raising taxes or reaching into their reserves, we're able to make investments in our future today. We're well positioned to not only recover but emerge from the recession an even stronger city, a more resilient city, a small but scrappy globally competitive city where all neighborhoods are complete and connected and livable, a Portland that is a city of cutting edge innovation and culture, deeply sustainable, integrated with nature, and a city that finally offers all of its citizens the most equal of opportunities. When I took office 24 months ago, 25 months ago, deep internal budget cuts loomed on the horizon just as Portlanders needed city services more than ever. City government did not have a plan to use its substantial external spending power to create uh, private sector jobs in the worst of the recession and pockets of chronic city government organizational dysfunction unnecessarily frustrated residents. We as a city council were required to act and plan simultaneously, and we did. Your city council took immediate actions on all three problems. On the city's budget, we immediately cut spending earlier and deeper than city financial staff recommended. We made more cuts as part of our next two budgets. And thanks to these early actions, and with some good luck, the city ended last fiscal year with a one-time $9.4 million general fund surplus. And we begin the next budget year with a $22 million one-time budget surplus. We negotiated over the last two years eight uh, union contracts, saving an estimated $10 million per year. We never touched our general fund financial reserve, and we maintained our top municipal credit rating. Let me repeat, 
Next year, we begin with a $22 million one-time general fund surplus. Over the past two years, we have invested some of these extra savings into services uh, for Portlanders that are getting hit hardest by this recession, hardest by budget cuts to fund addiction and mental health programs, to fund new programs for those placing, uh, unemployed facing homelessness and small businesses facing declining revenues. We set out to fast track external spending on city public works and construction projects, mostly using already designated resources to help create private sector jobs when our construction workers needed it most. And what happened? In the last 25 months, we have fast-tracked nearly five years' worth of external construction contracts. That's half a billion dollars, nearly three times the previous annual spending amounts, helping to save or create 2,000 jobs. And because it's a recession, we got great bids from our contractors, saving taxpayers money. Not satisfied just to tamp down government spending, not satisfied just to fast track external spending to help people in the private sector work, we also on the city council went after those pockets of chronic dysfunction. We merged the Bureau of Housing and the Office of Sustainable Development to infuse our core values of sustainability into everything we plan and everything we do. We separated the, Bureau, uh, the Portland Development Commission and the Bureau of Housing, allowing both to deliver better on their core missions. And the commissioner who had to create the new Bureau of Housing out of scratch and has done a fantastic job is here somewhere in this sea of faces. Commissioner Nick Fish, thank you for your great work. He spent years making the Bureau of Development Services into the kind of permitting agency that helped get through the kinds of green and sustainable and smart developments that we all want to see in our city. It took a lot of effort, but at the end of that effort, there were still eight permitting bureaus outside of his purview. One of the other pockets of dysfunction that we addressed was to co-locate all nine development services bureaus under one roof, and things have gotten better. A big thanks, not sexy work, incredibly controversial. A big thanks to City Commissioner Randy Leonard. <laughs> Finally, a passion for the river. One of the most controversial land use, use issues that the city has faced over the years a river that we want to be more environmentally healthy and we want to succeed more economically. Difficult stuff. Some great work done over the years, but scattered and moving too slowly for this city council's uh, taste. Uh, she put together the new Office of Healthy Working Rivers and she deserves great applause for doing so. Commissioner Amanda Fritz. He took on the police bureau so that I could focus for the first 15 months on getting the strategy in place to create jobs, uh, taking on uh, some of the well-intentioned, but uh, in the end, uh, some of well-intended community mush to help schools, which I will get into in a minute. Today, he's uh, spending time with his daughter, but he deserves a round of applause for what he does for the environment and the Bureau of Environmental Services every day and for his work on the Police Bureau. Commissioner Dan Saltzman is Chief of Staff, Brendan Finn.
But on behalf of the City Council, I can tell you these reforms are just a down payment on uh, making city government a continuously improving uh, uh, servant to the people of this city. Now, I also want, before I go on, uh, to thank a, a group of people that outside of Portland um, are treated as rock stars, but inside the city we sometimes uh, uh, forget to acknowledge them. If, if you're a City of Portland staffer, you're invited often to go speak to cities and locales all over the world because of the kind of work that this city government does. Would every city worker please stand and uh, let's give them a round of applause and PDC. <laughs> well, good work in our improvements on city government, but obviously we're not out of the economic storm yet. Too many Portlanders and their businesses are struggling, uh, but there are encouraging signs. I was pleased to hear the usually somewhat dour University of Oregon economist Tim Dewey report that the economy in Oregon appears to be on the upswing, including jobs, consumer confidence, and orders for capital goods and record profits for some of our most important traded sector partners. Intel, Nike suggests the spring of thaw is emerging from the long winter of economic recession. And our manufacturing base, uh, companies like Daimler and Ajinomoto and Danner Lacrosse are hiring or expanding their local facilities. We have retained or recruited new firms to Portland who are attracted to our commitment to sustainability such as Vestas Wind, Revolt Batteries for Electric Cars, and Nexian Renewable Energies. And Portland Development Commission Chair Scott Andrews and I just returned, literally, from Spain, uh, where we visited the global headquarters of Ibadrola, the renewable energy firm that's located just a few blocks from here in the Pearl District. It's a great firm. Clean technology is something that every city is trying to grow or steal from every other city. And I'm here to say that we will work harder than any city to grow our companies and keep our companies. And yes, that means Ibadrola. Scott Andrews, please stand and be thanked for your tireless efforts as PDC chair. And I want to buck up the city a little bit because when we talk about making Portland a more international city. I, I get this sense sometimes that Portlanders, you know, they see Los Angeles and New York and maybe even Seattle and, and San Francisco, and they wonder if that's really realistic for us to become that smaller but scrappy global city. It is. And let me give you a couple of statistics to prove it. Among U.S. metro regions, Portland is second in the nation when it comes to exports as a percentage of gross metro product. That means all except one city in the United States, metropolitan num or regional numbers here, so all but one region, city region in the United States is, uh, no other city is a trader city, a city of trade and export as the Portland Vancouver area is. And I would be remiss if I didn't at this point also thank um, our, our partners to the north because the metropolitan region does include uh, the county to the north of the Columbia River. And we are very lucky today. We're very lucky as Portland to have a, a chair of Clark County and a mayor in Vancouver who we don't always necessarily agree with, but we always communicate and we always try to work to the win-win solutions. Please join me in welcoming Clark County Chair Steve Stewart and Vancouver Mayor Tim Levitt. It means $22 million in total earnings for the region and 126,000 jobs are derived from exports. And President Barack Obama right now is at Intel in Hillsborough because 
of his call for the U.S. to double gro export growth by 2015. And since World War II, only four metro areas in America have met this goal in such a short time frame. And even when we weren't as collectively and as strategically focused as we will be or could be, in the last business cycle, Portland, the Portland region was one of those four. This shows that we can continue to grow our international exports, and we must. We must assume the goal of becoming that smaller, scrappy global city. Because if we don't, we risk becoming an economic suburb to places like our neighbors like Seattle and San Francisco. And that's why six months into my term, the City Council adopted a new strategy to better position Portland for the global competition as the recession lifts. The economic development strategy to goal is to create 10,000 new jobs by 2014. And for the first time in 15 years, we have a tight focus on the key areas where our city and region can outcompete any other region in the world. Clean technology, software, digital development, advanced manufacturing, athletic and outdoor industries, and later today, I'm announcing a fifth, but hang on. Again, we've had to plan and act simultaneously. And the day that the City Council approved this new strategy, we also celebrated with the first order of streetcars, locally built by Oregon Ironworks United Streets Car, helped to launch a new advanced manufacturing industry here in the city of Portland. That was Wednesday. On Thursday, we created the Home Energy Efficiency Pilot Program called Clean Energy Works. I, some of you who were here last time know that I focused on this. To increase your home's comfort and to create green job opportunities for those Portlanders and those in the region that have historically been shut out of Portland's good times. We're just about to clean, uh, complete our 500th pilot home and thanks to a $20 million additional investment by the federal government, we're going statewide. We're saving energy and we're creating jobs. As access to capital has been moving at a glacial pace. Uh, so last year, you'll recall that I announced the creation of the Portland Seed Fund to invest in the city's startups to make sure that we are the place where those new global competitive businesses uh, start. We put in a half a million dollars, your city council, and uh, the great state treasurer, Ted Wheeler, matched another half a million dollars with the Oregon Growth Account. And today, I'm pleased to announce that we have just about reached our $2 million goal with the rest coming from private investors and the fund managers who is, is working really hard, Jim Huston and Angela Jackson, thank you for getting us to the $2 million level. Where are you? There they are. In the past two years, the City Council, even though we've had to cut ongoing budgets, sustained the business tax reforms, the business tax reductions on 13,000 mostly smaller, mostly locally owned businesses uh, that we approved in the previous two years. And we agreed as a region to merge the Greenlight Greater Portland with regional partners. And for the first time in this region's history, Instead of two economic marketing agencies, one public, one private, we now have a four-county public-private marketing and co coordinating agency. And I would uh, like Aaron Flynn and if Mark Gantz is in the room to stand up. This was really hard work. Thank you for your efforts. <laughs> He's over there. And um, the other uh, people ask me what, uh, in my travels around the world, what, uh, what kind of feedback do I, I get about Portland? 
Well, the honest answer is no, most people have no idea <laughs> what a Portland is. Um, they're likely to be more familiar with Portland cement than they are with Portland, Oregon, despite the fact that we read about ourselves in newspapers and occasionally on TV. But that outreach, that visibility, now that we're getting our act together, now that we have a coherent strategy, especially around economic development, it is now time for us to, all of us, to get out and promote this region. Uh, I started to do so about three weeks ago when I stopped by the German Embassy in Washington, D.C. and had an opportunity to meet Klaus Schirot and invite him to Portland. And he said yes. So he'll be here on um, March 10th. Why did I pick uh, the German Embassy? Because there is so much German investment in Portland. Names like Adidas, Daimler, Wacker, Sotronic, and Solar World. Uh, I'll be joining with the Portland Business Alliance uh, later in March and encourage you to sign up as well to go visit these companies and let them know that their partnership with this part of the world is not only good for business, but we appreciate it. We know they have choices. Germany is also a very good partner for us because it is one of the most sustainable cities in the world and also one of the most economically successful. That's exactly what we're aiming for here, and I encourage you to get involved. Now, exporting is about more than tangible goods. Uh, for, exa for example, tomorrow, uh, the Decemberists are returning for their hometown concert after their number one debut album on the charts. And Esperanza Spalding will be coming back to town next week. <laughs> Esperanza is the product of public education, public arts education. <laughs> and the second season of Portlandia was green lighted. <laughs> I have to say it. Put a bird on that. <laughs> but to keep our culture flowing, to keep our culture flowing as an export, I ask you to support Governor John Kitzhopper's leadership to expand our film and video industry tax incentives at the state level when we talk about the fourth year of leverage filming in Portland, when we talk about that second season for Portlandia, and now NBC has just green-lighted a pilot for Portland, we're talking about big dollars that help keep Portland families fed. It needs to happen. That incentive, if it isn't used, it doesn't cost us anything. It's a great incentive. It needs our support. So our hard work is beginning to pay off, and we're better positioned than ever to succeed as, as we come out of uh, this global recession. But I want to put uh, two uh, exclamation points on the end of this part of my remarks talking about uh, prosperity, economic security. The first is equity. Portland is many wonderful things and has, uh, we're very lucky to live in a city like this. But this is also a city that needs to be humble in the knowledge that our greatness has not been available to all Portlanders. And that too often, hardworking, talented, wonderful Portlanders, newcomers, and people of color are shut out of equal opportunities. That's all they're asking for. In the months ahead, working with Commissioner Amanda Fritz and building off of the work started by former Mayor Tom Potter, we are going to take this to the next level. Now, I understand that the discussion of race uh, makes, uh, can make people a little nervous in this city. Portland polite is uh, not very polite uh, on this issue. But in the next couple of months, you're going to be getting a curbsider newsletter 
uh, to every house and every business in the city. And it's going to invite you into a series of, of workshops and public meetings. And in those, you'll have an opportunity to have the kind of honest discussions that we all face. We are all a product of mass media. None of us, regardless of our race, regardless of our background, escapes unscathed from the kind of unconscious stereotyping and bigotry and isms that is constantly bombarded us uh, with the mass media. This is very important, and I hope you'll join us. It's about building bridges. And boy, have there been a lot of other bridges to build. We have worked on the Selwood Bridge, the Portland-Milwaukee uh, Bridge, and uh, we're also working on the Columbia River Crossing. Uh, the good mayor and, and the good chair and former president uh, Rex Burkholder, myself, and others in local government, I believe have made a tremendous positive contribution to getting a new crossing across the Columbia River. And I do believe we need a new crossing across the Columbia River. I do not want our future dependent upon 50% of our ability to cross the Columbia River to be dependent upon drawbridges. Are the bridges going to fall down tomorrow? No. But they're drawbridges, some of the last in the United States. It has been, um, how should I say politely, um, among our local officials and uh, project team, it has been a, at times a, a, a push and pull struggle. But we're down to decision time. And I would just uh, make a plea to the team that is working on this and the governor's office who oversee that team to work with us on the local level. Uh, thus far, what we have promoted has saved money and has made for a better project. We're at a key decision point right now. And so my plea to the staff and my plea to the governor's office is listen to us. We don't need further delay. So there's been innovation and important advances in our private sector and in government, but to achieve the resilience that we're capable of, we must diversify our economy. And we have a wonderful opportunity. So I'm touching back on that issue of clusters, of, of, of clusters that are focused on where we we have a genuine global strengths, and where we know on that particular strength, we're going to see the fastest economic uh, growth in the years ahead. That's what the clusters are all about. The welcome mat is out for all businesses, but when we're being proactive, instead of being all over the place, we're being focused and strategic on where we can get the most benefit. So I'm pleased today to announce on behalf of the Portland Development Commission um, the proposal for a fifth cluster on research and commercialization. And let me tell you why. We're a city that invents things, but we don't make enough off the things we invent. We need to address this. We need to be a city that invents it, makes it, and sells it to customers around the world. Take the city's largest employer, Oregon Health and Sciences University. They have made remarkable research strides in recent years with world-renowned Brian Drucker, leading OHSU Knight Cancer Institute in the quest to kill cancer. And while OHSU brings life-saving medicine to patients when they need it most, they also bring jobs to our regions. The patents and the R&D that they uh, lead leads to future export successes. And royalties from this intellectual property, the second is the second largest export in 2008 for the Portland region. It highlights our strength in innovation and ability to secure patents and intellectual properties. Coupled with our manufacturing infrastructure that is already here, it can make us incredibly more successful. To facilitate this world-class research to market, we need cutting-edge universities, and I would like you to join me in the cutting edge university we have in Oregon Health and Sciences University. We've got the good doctor, his team, and the president of OHSU, Mr. Robertson. Please stand up.
cutting edge research, world class research, commercialization needs a world class Portland State University. And under the leadership of President Vim Vivelle, Portland State University has seen explosive growth as it charts its maturity from humble commuter, commuter college to academic world leader in many sustainable ways. So today, I am uh, calling in the chits, so to say. Everyone talks a good game about wanting to support education. People rightfully point out that we spend too much money on the wrong end of the continuum on things like jails and prisons and the such, and not enough on the front end around education, uh, K through 12, higher education. I'm gonna talk about that more in a, in a minute. So today I'm proposing an urban renewal district focused on Portland State University, focused on growing it, focused on making it more successful, and I ask you to join me with this. We have the president's spouse here. Where is she? The first lady of Portland State University. I know that urban renewal districts are controversial, and I look forward to the conversations uh, with my friend, uh, Chair Jeff Kogan, uh, with Carol Smith of the Portland School Board, going back to the stakeholder group that we've created. I want to get this done um, if there's support for it uh, by the end of this calendar year. Um, I am confident that we can continue to deliver on these higher expectations for ourselves and the economy. Uh, PDC has made incredible advances, um, and I'm pleased today to introduce to you its new executive director. On behalf of Chair Scott Andrews and the PDC board, please say hello to your new executive director, Portland Development Commission Executive Director, Patrick Quinton. He has the background in small business. He has the background in financing uh, that we need. We're doing uh, the good work to grow and retain our key industries, and we're competing better in a global market, but we need our young people and our students to be able to better compete against their global peers for living wage jobs and the companies uh, that produce. As I, if you've listened to any of my campaign speeches or State of the City speeches, you know that I raise the high school graduation rate issue every time. It's stunningly low. According to Harvard University, the lifetime earnings gap between those with a college degree and those without is $1 million during a lifetime, a million dollar gap. We have an obligation to prepare our students to be capable adult, adults to keep them in school and help them reach their full potential. When I took office, we could all agree on that but few resources focused on improving educational performance, uh, and too many of them were scattered. In 2010 was the year of reform in tracking educational performance. We brought together government, education, nonprofit, nonprofit, private philanthropic partners, and for the first time, we have one approach to measure student success, to define what it means to provide an education. It's called Cradle to Career, and I am exceptionally excited about it. I co-chair this effort uh, with County Chair uh, Jeff Kogan, and I'd also like to recognize uh, Portland Park, Ro uh, Park Rose Superintendent Karen Gray and Portland Public Schools Superintendent Carol Smith. Would you all please stand and take a, take a bow? And as with our job creation, so too with our educational work, we acted and planned at the same time. Uh, we created the Summer Youth Connect programs in partnerships with Work Systems Incorporated to help at-risk students connect the dots between classroom attendance, graduation, and jobs. And I'd like you to meet Sumitra Seti, and incoming sophomore at David Douglas High School in 2009. Sumitra participated in the first year of Summer Youth Connect. She was born in a Bhutanese refugee camp in Nepal. Through a federal resettlement program, she and her family arrived in Portland, speaking very little English, and at first struggling to get by. In just a few months, Sumitra joined Portland Summer Youth Connect, where she made up school credits, engaged with other youth, 
and now she is headed, with the help of our new scholarship program, headed to Portland Community College. Please join me in welcoming first her family, her brother and her mom, and then Sumitra. This is great, and we can push the envelope uh, to do further. We must engage more businesses to the, create the kind of early worksite opportunities to show youth a path to a brighter future. And speaking of business and education, I'm heartened by the outpouring of support for the Portland School bond measures, and the, we have two. Uh, school bond measures. It's clear that education truly is a priority for Portlanders, and I urge you all to support both the Park Rose and Portland Public School bond measures on May 17th. <laughs> Public safety is one of the most basic city services and key to achieving any effort at long-term resiliency. I'm pleased to report that overall crime rates are as low as they have been in 40 years. But we still have a few issues, more than a few issues, that demand our attention, and we've gone right after them. Human trafficking, where people, mostly young women, are being bought and sold for sexual exploitation. This is happening every day in our region, and in our city. For months, I have been working with Commissioners Dan Saltzman and County Commissioner Diane McKeel with Oregonians Against Trafficking Humans with the Seroptimus Club, Janice Youth, and other community partners to create a system that supports escape, safe escapes for these youth. Because of our efforts, human trafficking, human trafficking will have no place in this city. We have also addressed the long neglected is issue in this community of illegal guns. Now, I'm originally from Montana. I grew up in Newport, so I had an inkling that seeking to address the issue of illegal guns might be controversial. It was, but it was also and is the right thing to do using tougher federal laws and other innovative enforcement tools, the Portland Police Bureau and others are taking illegal guns off the street and keeping them out of the hands of children. On April 9th, we'll host another gun turn-in event in the Rose Quarter. <laughs> Meanwhile, since taking over as police commissioner last May, we have made tough but fair decisions about police accountability. We are hiring a more diverse workforce, adding drug and steroid testing, and increasing independent expert and citizen oversight of our operations. At a time when there are lots of questions about the relationship between the police and the community, these changes are crucial. As police commissioner, I would like to congratulate the Bureau on continuously striving for excellence and to extend my gratitude to Chief Mike Reese, his team and officers for the difficult and important work they do to keep us safe. Please stand up. Having been along ride-alongs, the change in the everyday work of peacekeeping and, and law enforcement uh, between when I served as Vera's chief of staff, uh, when she was police commissioner, and when I came back as police commissioner myself, it's changed remarkably. And with the cuts that have already occurred to the human and social safety net and the 20% cut looming for the state general fund, the work of our peacekeepers, our police officers, is going to get that much harder. Well, the chief and I and, and the city council are determined to give the kind of training and support for every police officer to rise to this challenge, because I don't think 
we have any other choice. So today, I'm pleased to announce that as part of my proposed budget, I will be including funding for a police training facility, something that has been wished for for well over 40 years, and I look forward to working with the council to make it happen. We're looking at the location at uh, Portland International Raceway. And finally, I'm proposing another perhaps controversial but common sense and necessary local government structural reform to improve the safety of our community, especially to improve our ability to uh, prosecute certain kinds of crimes that right now, due to budget cuts, are simply a basic traffic ticket, and to also to backfill the looming cuts in mental health service programs and human service programs that are going to continue. Look out on our streets. I get letters, I get calls, I see op-eds in the newspaper about why don't you do something about what's going on on our streets in terms of people that are clearly uh, addled or addicted or down on their luck. Well, we have been working, and today I'm offering another opportunity. I don't have the control to make this happen, but together we can. Today I'm offering to Multnomah County Sheriff Dan Stanton and the Board of County Commissioners to take over and fund the management of the River Patrol unit using only Marine Board revenues. This move can free up over a million dollars for the county to put into the prosecution of misdemeanor drug crimes like we're seeing more of in Old Town Chinatown, to backfill what will otherwise be cuts to crucial mental health services, and in turn, we will weave a stronger social safety net to the benefit of all Portlanders throughout the city. Turf must not stand in our way. We love Portland because it is a collection of unique neighborhoods with unique character. But we have to recognize, well, every, Portland, every person in Portland lives in a neighborhood. Not all neighborhoods have everything that Portlanders need. So we've restructured the Portland Development Commission to explicitly acknowledge this reality, and we are working to fill in the gaps. We will be introducing to the City Council in the weeks ahead the new Neighborhood Economic Development Action Plan. This is important because nine out of 10 Multnomah County workers work at a business that is 50 employees or less, and it's clear that small business and neighborhood business prosperity is job number one. With the Neighborhood Economic Development Action Plan, we will work with community leaders and local business associations to lift up the unique character of our neighborhoods, invest in revitalization of our commercial streets, and help residents connect to living wage jobs. Last year in my speech, I told you about our commitment to launching the Portland Main Street program. I, I shared a, a vision with you of Southeast Foster in the heart of Lentz. That vision of a safe and vital street served by streetcar where people gather and businesses thrive. Over the past year, we've made important steps forward, and this year we will go from concept to action plan. That, along with Main Streets in Hillsdale and Alberta and St. John's, we're seeing businesses and residents with the new focus from the Portland Development Commission coming together and seeing more complete neighborhoods come out of that effort. And it's just the beginning. Today we're introducing to implement this plan the Neighborhood Opportunity District, which is a smaller scale uh, funding for five neighborhoods, five neighborhood districts in the city. Without the larger scope or length of traditional urban renewal debt, these micro districts can jumpstart small scale, big impact projects while not significantly hampering the revenues of Multnomah County or the city of Portland. And while we're investing in neighborhood vitality, I want you to consider this. Approximately 40% of Portlanders live at least a mile away from a grocery store. While this might not sound like a big deal, it really defines how livable your neighborhood is. So today I'm announcing that we have an initiative a request for proposals with grocery, that we'll be making to grocery stores. This has been done in other cities to address their food deserts, to make sure that we have grocery stores in every part of the city. Park Rose deserves one, Lentz deserves one, every neighborhood deserves fresh, affordable food.
Before I close, I want to thank the City Club, who's about to give me the hook, and the Friday Forum sponsors uh, for providing this venue. Um, if there are any, uh, uh, County uh, Chair Jeff Kogan, where is he? He was here. Okay. Uh, and who else have I missed? Oh, I'd like to introduce to you the new Chair of the Planning and Sustainability Commission, Andre Ba. Where's Andre? There he is. And finally, those are some of my private partners. I'd like to uh, give a big hug and lots of love to my private partner, my boyfriend, uh, Peter Zuckerman. Embarrass him, make him stand up. Uh, my mom, Kara, my stepfather, Stuart, and my 91-year-old grandma, Marie Gibbons. One more page. One more. Uh, what I truly love most about my job is discovering each day what uh, Portlanders and Portland is capable of. Brick by brick, student by student, neighborhood by neighborhood, we are eliminating the underlying weaknesses and leveraging our strengths. We will continue the work to pull out of the recession to get to a place beyond recovery, a place of lasting resilience. Together, we will keep growing our traded sector industries as we invest in our Main Street businesses. We will make every neighborhood safer by reforming the police policies, by getting illegal weapons off the street, and by protecting victims of human trafficking. We will see more young people like Sumitra and her peers go on to higher education. And we will see the youth of today enter the workforce of tomorrow, prepared to succeed. The work is leading us to a better future. With the recession lifting, we're taking what we love most about this city, and we're protecting it. And where the city needs work, we imagine our better future, and we're building it. We're creating a city. We love, but a city we ought to be, a home to cutting-edge innovation and culture, the most resilient and environmentally sustainable city, and a place that offers all of its people the most equal of opportunities. Thank you. question for our speaker, as always, will be from our Friday Forum host, and our host today is Pat McCormick, who is a City Club Governor. He's, for 20 years, was with Conkling, Fisk & McCormick, a public affairs research and PR firm. He has a new firm, AMPM PR, which he started with his daughter, Allison. He's been a City Club member since 1969. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for that uh, presentation today. Uh, it's an ambitious agenda that you've laid out for the year ahead. I want to know at next year's forum, what do you hope and what should we expect to be the single accomplishment that you'll be most proud of and bring back to us to talk about? That we have, uh, on a net basis, made our way back with uh, the 10,000 jobs that I've set out to create, uh, working with everybody by 2014. Uh, by this time next year, I'd like to announce that we have had at least half of those jobs, at least 5,000 jobs created. That's what Portland families need right now more than anything is a good job. We will now take questions from the floor. Asking questions at City Club is a privilege of City Club membership. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and since we're running short on time, ask your question in 30 seconds or less. Otherwise, I'll hold up my question card and we'll wait not so patiently. Well, my name is Sabah Ahmed and I've been a City Club member since I think 2008. Uh, my question is regarding, well, first of all, thank you for all your work on racial equity 
Um, on behalf of the Oregon Muslim Citizens Alliance, I wanted to ask what your position is on the JTTF. There has been a lot of FBI harassment of Muslims locally, and uh, we just want to know what the mayor is doing for that. Thanks. So, um, sorry, I switched mic. Um, so as I, as, as I look at this issue, and I think the city council looks at this issue, uh, foremost in our minds is protecting the legal rights of every Portlander, every Oregonian, everyone who's here, um, keeping Portland, uh, making Portland an even more open and inclusive city, but at the same time making sure that we have the partnerships in place, we have the resources in place to prevent anyone that would seek to abuse that openness and abuse those rights. Um, this city council over the past 45 days has dug very deeply into this issue. Uh, next week, we move into decision making. My goal is that uh, we would have as much unanimity moving forward in a direction as possible. Um, and having just completed the work session yesterday, um, I'm going to spend the weekend digesting the great information we have. So stay tuned next week. Chris Andre, City Club member and a KBOO radio producer. My question is virtually identical to the last one. Um, concerns on behalf of the citizenry uh, regarding um, introducing the JTTF back into the community, whether we actually need it. And that leads me actually to my question. Uh, I, the police training facility is a terrific idea, more police training, more training in how to deal with deranged individuals and that sort of thing. But uh, generally speaking, to rebuild community uh, confidence and trust in officers of the peace would seem to be critical. How does that fit into your uh, restructuring and um, your um, renewal of Portland Police Department? Well, uh, fortifying the trust between um, residents and, and government, especially residents and, and peacekeepers, is um, you know, our top priority. Um, I think that we have the team in place that understands more fully than ever what that really means. Um, and uh, our goal is to reinforce, not just in city government generally, but police bureau as well, this sense of continuous improvement. Um, not that we lurch on and fits and starts only when there's a big controversy, but that we're improving each and every day. In the year ahead, for the first time in the history of the department, we will be doing uh, employee evaluations. And in addition to performance improvements, it's time also, the way forward, is when you see good work being done, when we see good work being done, to reward it and grow it. Ted K, City Club member. Sam, do you plan to run for re-election? Haven't decided. On that note, we're done for today. I would like to invite everybody to join us next week with Congressman Earl Blumenauer. And join me in thanking Mayor Sam Adams for today. We're adjourned.